All right. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, minutes are in the chat. So feel free to drop your name in and any books that you're reading right now. I just got done with a kind of an old kind of computer science is actually about building, but the timeless way of building. And then I think I'm going to start a, a fiction book at this point. So I'm not a fast book reader, so <laughs> but that's okay. My wife is a like, uh, she's one of those readers that <laughs> just reads all the time, <laughs> which is kind of jealous. Wow. Oh, yeah, I saw the, the movie. I didn't know it was a book, but that makes sense. Makes total sense. It's actually a whole series, and I'm liking it a lot. Um, yeah. All right, that's a good tip. I actually I put this in there sometimes just for myself. This question. <laughs> it's a good question. I'm also reading Power: The Forty Eight Laws of Power because I have to deal with the narcissist, and I'm like, trying to figure that out. <laughs> My wife has ordered me to re read The Wild Robot um, before oh, the movie comes out. It's good. It's good. I'm excited about it. It looks amazing. We can have five minutes in the next meeting for a little book club. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. Because by then the movie will have come out. So not only will we have read the book, but the movie will be You out. can watch the movie. That's right. <laughs> and maybe I'll just watch the movie like olden days and pretend I read the book, like how I used to do book reports in high school. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. So, uh, okay. So like, just a couple things. So one, um, we have often talked about kind of these open source program offices that obviously you're all part of and the demonstration of value, you know, like what is the open source work that's occurring at your university, like how is that actually having an impact in the world. Um, and so we had talked about connecting with the UN SDGs, if you remember that conversation, and we had talked about, I think, I don't remember how many SDGs there are, 17, something like that, but we had talked about, did I really get that right? It's burned in my brain. Um, we had talked about how open source can play a role in contributing to the UN SDGs. Uh, we had talked about having kind of our first meeting uh, at Open Source Summit Europe. This is a picture of everybody that attended this um, first meeting. So it's really great. Uh, I know a lot of those people and some I don't know. Uh, so there is, there is a notes that Georg had taken during this meeting just to kind of organize thoughts. And then these are some of the takeaways that Georg had just kind of written on his own as well. So, you know, not perfect science here, but just kind of Georg's own thoughts. And so, David, I'm kind of giving this to you because I know you had expressed an interest in kind of leading some of these things as we think about SDGs. The question would be, do we want to have a whole new meeting to talk about this or do you think this is something that university I suppose would also have an interest in and it's just a conversation we could continue here and this would just be a piece that you would kind of speak to um I think it needs its own working group okay um, that's I thought this was going to be the kickoff for it, it a new working group um I think it is I was just it was kind of an open question that was in my mind because I know a lot of people that are on this call would probably have an interest as well and that's yeah okay. several several people Angela Saeed um okay. Stephanie and maybe others I might be forgetting have reached out um okay. I think I think a lot of us really care about the impact <laughs> of our okay. work and research on the community level the, the global level um and this is yeah this is attempting to to try to capture some of that. So um I my thought was I had reached out to Georg and and um and thanked him for for doing this and um for getting the group together and, and I agree with his three points. Um I'm I don't yeah I was gonna reach out to Ruth because she had uh offered to co-lead this with yeah. me. Ruth right and, there. Yeah, yeah and figure out the the logistics. Um not super excited about another working group but I think getting um, I f I'm totally blanking right now on his name. There's a the UN. Um, he might be in that picture too. Um, he's a UN person that's in Michael? based in Oregon. Yeah, Michael Downey. That's yeah. That's um, yeah. So getting his involvement in Gay Org um, and Jonathan Starr to to get his understanding from like 
okay. what the output should be formatted and, and maybe getting a couple other key people involved as, as well as anybody that just wants to be involved. Okay. We are, we're set to do that. It's not a problem. Um, one of the, an option, at least for times, would be immediately before this meeting every other week. I don't know how, I don't know how you're all on like stacking meetings versus spreading meetings. I know people have different strategies. Um, I don't have a strategy. Um, <laughs> they just show up when they show up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I'm fine with stacking. I, yeah, I don't have a strategy. Okay. I'm fine with not stacking. I, I'm fine with, I hadn't, don't have any time in mind. Um, so okay. We had first. just, there was, there was a, a DEI meeting for chaos that was right before this meeting that we moved to a biweekly cadence. And so the 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock US Central, just something to think about for you as we move forward. That would work yeah. for me. I also, I have a question about like connecting with, um, if we're going to measure software and SDGs, connecting with some of those city labs, um, we have two meetings here to kind of talk about that. Um, but if we connect with those city labs, I, I feel like we can get some good use case, um, even if it's qualitative data. Um, the storytelling there is really powerful, especially if you can do like connections across countries. Um, I, I think... I think we, if we could think on how we might incorporate some of those people, I think we might get some really good, uh, we, really, we might get some really good stories about metrics that we could, that we could contextualize with other metrics. Cool. What are the city labs that you refer to? So let's see, the German woman, they had a panel on it at the UN. Um, let me see. I, she's like, um, her name is uh, Gisa Zimmer, okay. and she runs she runs like a city lab in Germany that's also connected with the Sovereign Technology Fund. Mm -hmm. um, but then they had a couple of other ones um, that are connect that that are using open source software and they're spreading it. Like one once one was on transportation. I'll have to look back at the agenda. Okay. Um, but one was on transportation and they were talking about how open source code is integral to making sure that those transportation um, applications that they're building work across borders, okay. um, which is really important for people, you know, that are traveling and things like that. Um, but if we look back at the agenda, I think we could come up with a few really good names and I think awesome. there'd be a way to connect and, and just reach happen. out and say, join us. We'd love to have. Okay, perfect. Okay, um, great. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, I've talked to Jacob Green about that angle too. Um, and he, there's a, somebody that's US based. Um, I think NIST is doing some project around City Labs. Um, and there's somebody named Lindsay uh, Thompson to, from Johns Hopkins that he was trying to get me in touch with that's doing like a Baltimore um, okay. City City Lab thing. So, but uh, yeah, I, I like the idea of this being a very global international collaboration awesome so okay. i don't want it to just be us focused <laughs> okay perfect uh all right well this is great so i think at this point um sounds like we have some info from that kickoff and a bunch of people to reach out to so i can connect with elizabeth or david i don't know if you've been talking to elizabeth too just to kind of organize things in chaos so you're all set yeah to she had reached out and offered to volunteer to help like figure out what the working group name and, and that kind of stuff. So I was going to reach out to her and, and uh, Ruth and try to figure out the next steps. Okay. Did you all track down after this meeting, the actual notes that Georg took, not just a summary, and then you can go through those as well, unless you already saw them. You have them, David. Um, he forwarded me, but, but it was, uh, maybe it was just a summary. I saw his three points. I didn't see much. There was a Google that. doc as well, somewhere in that thread that he's like, this is the straight notes. That we took. Uh, okay. I didn't see that. Okay. Just maybe check that out a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other comments on that? I was really happy to see, you know, a dozen people there. That was really nice. <laughs> uh, all right, cool. Um, the other thing I wanted to, the two other things that I wanted to bring up. So one was the WHO has been working with GitHub on the development of a dashboard that they use. 
um, to understand kind of their engagements with open source. And I thought I'd bring this to your attention. Um, it's a, and they use a lot of chaos metrics. That's how I know about this. Um, so it's just something that I don't know if, if at your OSPOs or at your, at your universities, if, if dashboards are a thing that you would ever care to start thinking about in terms of tracking, <laughs> Lord knows what, you know what I mean? But just ways to, to have some insights into the projects that say perhaps are grant funded that would maybe connect with the last point I have on the agenda for today or um, projects that you are um, inherently dependent on like upstream R packages, you know, like if there's visualizations that you need as ways to think about this. Um, in this blog, they actually provide a fairly um, decent way of thinking about how to build these dashboards from an architecture perspective. So I, it's just mostly questions for you. Are these things that, is this something that would be interesting to you? And would this be a, a path that we would want to go down as a group to think about you know, things we want to reveal about the communities that we care about? So it's interesting to me. I think I need to talk to Michael and Alex because they'd be the ones who'd have to help put it together. Yeah. Um, and maintaining it would be interesting. Okay. Um, just on your first- I'm interested, we're interested. Okay, okay. Because it might be something, and if we could think about it as a group together, like what would be those, like maybe a couple things, like what would be the, the a starter context that we would want to ask these questions against? And again, it could be projects say that that opt that opt in, and they want to understand their own their own health characteristics, um, and that's data that they want to report back to say funders. That could be like a, a one use case, um, or like I said, another could be a series of core dependencies that we've identified at the university that we also want to keep an eye on just for ourselves to understand if there's instability in the upstream. Two very different use cases. Um, David, do you know if this is something that you'd have an interest in? Um, yeah, probably. I'm, I'm, we, I'm way behind the, the eight ball on like identifying the open source projects here at, at GW. Um, we set up a project registry and we've built a stakeholder group and we're trying to connect out, but we haven't run a survey and got github handles really and i haven't done any api queries yet so okay. i have like a i'm very nervous about the just like scraping i want to kind of do the opt-in yeah um, approach um so yeah theoretically yeah it sounds great and i i like i agree with tom's question like um what was the i don't question? he says do you mean an organization organization wide dashboard which i think you do or individual dashboards for projects it would be organization wide, I think is how the WHO is thinking about this, like projects that they necessarily care about and just want to have a little bit better understanding about. Yeah, I'm theoretically, it, it sounds great. I can see lots of different use cases too. some, some being like the IT department, um, some being the researcher focus, and then some being, you know, more of the like the projects that different students and open okay. source community members are excited about or maintaining okay the other another use case which is something that i'm working on and also behind on is i want to get like an intern program set up kind of like kendall and uh, daniel are, are doing um and knowing what projects are are run out of the university that you know have maintainers and are looking for contributors would be pretty cool to know okay I will say I was very much into the opt-in space on people coming to us and we have a forum on our website and we um we we do dog and pony shows so I go to every research dean um in the fall and then I send them an email in January and then I I'll offer to go again to like their faculty lunches or whatever and we were just trying and trying and trying to get people to opt in. 
it actually we got participation but it's worked way better for us to go scrape the website for michael to send me the emails and for me to send intro emails and we've gotten tons of questions and participation because people then are sort of for forced to know that we exist i feel bad about it but it got way more participation that is very good to know i appreciate that <laughs> More, more targeted outreach than just here we are please feel free to reach out to us anytime you'd like but but more of a we know who you are and here's who we are <laughs> let's talk <laughs> yeah and okay it felt very funny those that first <laughs> round of emails but then we got people like oh i'm so glad you're here i have this question and i could be like we have consultants to help you or let me help you or we're gonna do a training on that so there. it's like cold calling. You never want to do it, but it worked. Okay. <laughs> it sounds like Tom's doing the same thing. So that's it did. That's um affirmation for you. Yes, very good yeah. affirmation. I will now be big brother. <laughs> <laughs> if you want Michael to help you, my Michael to help you with that, let me know. He's got he's just about ready to have containerize his script so it can be exported to other places to do discovery process and his is very conservative um he we did the big giant sweep uh initially and we ended up paring it down because we did we didn't want to be invasive but we also didn't know how useful that big wide sweep would be because our alumni emails are the same as our current emails mm -hmm. so um so anyway if you want code we're happy to connect and share yes what people, yeah okay great i, I do thank you <laughs> okay. David, um, and I'm I'm coming back from illness, so apologies if I come off as a little confused. Um, we just kicked off working with uh, Jonathan Starr on that mapping project as well, and that's a little bit of how we're tackling the scraping. Um, but same thing, we're we're looking to take that data and then kind of go through it manually and identify like, okay, these are people we should reach out to directly. Um, but yeah, also having that challenge of like, you know, not every project that we're interested in is clearly labeled as like a Carnegie Mellon project. It can be, you know, we're heavy contributors to some larger projects. So that that's kind of like what, I mean, when I say we just started, we started like a month ago with him, kind, kind of take a pass at this. Awesome, cool, thanks. I will try to ride your coattails. <laughs> open source way <laughs> use what others have done uh all right so the 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 kind of the any other comments on this it sounds like this was a helpful conversation in terms of how to identify people that may be able to be part of a dashboard that is down the road that may have an interest in in taking part in this Tom, I do think you actually raise an interesting question. I my question that I would riff off on that would be like, do you think our our developers that are big developers, like some of them have multiple projects going on, would they want a dashboard? That's an interesting question to me. Not necessarily that we would run, but that we would say, hey, these are you know time tested. Um, metrics and if you would like a dashboard kind of here's what that would look like and then if you report into us that'd be great but then this might just be useful for you i would i would say that's kind of the um open open question for us or at least for me right now because it's like we're finding with or at least i i personally have because I, I don't want to speak for for saeed um i don't know if you might have a different view on this, but I'm finding kind of these like three different categories. It's like, you know, I'm finding like the fully just within CMU projects. Um, then like on the other end, it's like, you know, CMU contributors to some very massive initiative, but there seems to be this like, to your question, this sweet spot where it might be like a three institution collaboration and like those faculty members have been a little bit more open to say like, oh yeah, maybe we can, on our end, we can set something up that all three groups can benefit from, from some kind of dashboard. 
And then like, what does that opt-in conversation look like from there? So like the, 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 it seems like the meaty part of the conversation is more within those kind of sweet spots where it's like a collaboration between like two or three different institutions where their teams are like maybe five people. Um, but I haven't really talked with anyone on that kind of like really large scale side of things. Yeah, I feel like it's worth poking around on. I mean, I'd certainly love it, but I I need to see how feasible it is and how sustainable it is. Mm -hmm. um, I jotted that down, Tom. I like that, that when you were talking about the collaborative projects, it reminded me a lot of, say, projects that get started at the Linux Foundation, where there may be a no need, and you identify three corporate, in this case, corporate participants that come together to solve a shared need or work on a shared problem. And sure, there may be other people who participate in that project, but the reality is it's those three companies in this case that are really driving that project. Um, and that, that could be the spot, I like that. Um, so it's something to think about. Um, and, and maybe it'll tie to this next issue that I bring up. Any other things on this? Because I think I have a comment that might tie in here. I lost my, hold on. All right. So the, and I think I, I haven't looked too deeply in this. I'm guessing it's building a dashboard in the GitHub interface would be my guess. So kind of leveraging the GitHub data that's available and just using that. So I'll look a little bit more into this. I just came across this like two or three days ago. Um, so the, the, the last thing, and it maybe hits with this, like these collaborative projects that you were bringing up, Tom, um, I've been talking a lot with grant agencies. So whether say it's the NSF or organizations like the Wellcome Trust or CZI about considering sustainability of open source projects. So I had heard the, the term professor wear. I don't know if you've ever heard this phrase. I only heard it for the first time. And it <laughs> it immediately resonated with me that, that there's this process where an agency gives uh, some people some money to work on some research or to do a thing. And as part of that effort, there is open source software that's produced. The funding runs out and naturally <laughs> the project goes away. So that's kind of, I think, the, the description of professor wear. And a, a lot of organizations, funding organizations now are, are I think, really either asking their um, grant recipients to go through training to think about sustainability beyond the grant period and what that could possibly look like or to even start commenting on it uh, within the proposal itself. So being a little bit more proactive that grant dollars aren't necessarily a path to sustainability, that community building could be that path as well. And so I'm wondering if there would be any interest in your organizations to think about ways to help um, uh, grant applicants think about open source as a path to sustainability. So I've been doing a lot of thinking about this and what that would look like. So a little like the, say the facility statement that goes into an NSF grant that you're probably, you know, horribly familiar with, like a, a, a true description of what sustainability for a project could look like. And subsequently what those metrics could be to demonstrate that, that path to sustainability as you're reporting to say your grant officer on a yearly basis. And this then goes back to the dashboard. Like if we if we can identify those projects that could have better success by declaring some path towards sustainability, it would make sense to, um, to have metrics around that declaration. Not just, I'm gonna build community, <laughs> it's all good, but I'm gonna build community and here's how I'm thinking about building community around this software and here, the things that we can take a look at and report back to you as a grant agency that demonstrate this success. The only reason I'm, again, I'm bringing this up is because I'm talking to an, a number of agencies that, that are looking at sustainability around the software that they fund. Like it's a real issue. So I'll leave it at that.
I have a question. What what do you mean the software that they fund? Do you just mean the research software yeah. that might happen to be an output of the research? Yeah. Or do you mean explicitly? Yeah. So say like um, say an organization is funding um, software development in the healthcare space, and they want that particular piece of software. <laughs> like it it serves a purpose for a, a greater audience than just say those three researchers or just to result in a publication um, or they fund a piece of software that like in the case of the SDGs is going to have life beyond the funding period. Like it's actually a piece of software that helps people address say a particular SDG. So at the end of three years, um, like how, how does, how do, how does that software live past three years if they don't get more money or does it just, evaporate. So that's what I mean. So yes, they might be funding software directly, or they might be funding research to which software is an output of that research. Does that help? Yeah, um, I have thoughts, but I don't know if they're valid. <laughs> um, to me, the 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 impetus, you know, with the Nelson memo is all the software or any research output needs to be made public. So right now, a lot, I think a lot of that professor where is just on a grad student's laptop and never is made public, never put on GitHub at all. So that would be a huge first step that they want to see. Um, whether it should be sustainable, I think that's an open question. Some of the things are maybe only have the time frame of their research That's fair. Yes. and some others maybe have some potential um to be sustainable you know i don't know i like the organic approach but i think it's so hard to search and discover things right now that that complicates um the issue but from a metrics perspective just being able to if i were nsf or nih being able to do some sort of query to see if the research software was public, you know, had a OSI license, um, was on GitHub or GitLab and available and um, would be a big plus. Um, and then, yeah, moving on, I don't, I don't exactly know how to do that next level sustainability challenge. That's, that seems to stop everybody. It does. It's a um, tricky one. Yeah, Tom. To 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 build off of what um, David was saying, I think like the thing that uh, comes to mind for me, and I think would be helpful in, in hearing like the definition from these funders when they talk about sustainability. Um, and I guess to like use a metaphor, it's like, well, are they considering software output like? publishing a book or starting a publication? Because I feel like those are two very different types of sustainability. And I feel like a lot of the conversations seem to steer towards this idea of like, well, when you release software, it's like you're starting a publication. You have to like, you know, it's like this, this ongoing high level of effort versus like, well, you've published a piece of software and then if, you know, and then it's, it's, as David said, like the, the, the goal was to get it open and out in the world. Mm -hmm. So I think like some, some like more clarifying language than just, just use it. And again, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm like I said, yeah. I'm, I'm working through some brain fog today. So oh, no, I, don't no. know if I come off as a little confused. No, it's completely fine. Um, my conversations have always been around the software. So um, things like, say, you know, the, the POSE program. So they're interested in funding projects, as you're all quite familiar with, around open source. Um, and they're asking grantees to go through training programs that help the grantees consider the open source projects that they are advancing, like how, again, can they outlive the funding that POSE provides for three years? So um, to your point, David, things like 
making it public? Have you thought about license? Like what is it, what is a governance document structure? Take a look at, have you thought about governance in your community? Um, so just helping researchers <laughs> kind of think a little bit longer term and even more than just GitHub, like just putting it out there is fine. Um, but even just adding license <laughs> and, and contributing documents can, can go a long way. Um, and so POSE is not the only organization that I've talked to that is interested in this and kind of outliving the funding cycle for that piece of software. And so to, to your point, Tom, I haven't really heard the conversation about sustainability in the form of like books or journals, which I agree is could be a form in and of itself. This is really about a, the software itself outliving the funding cycle. Oh, I, I apologize. I wasn't, I didn't mean like specifically books and journals. I, I was kind of trying to say the metaphor of like, Oh, okay. Like you, put out, you put out a piece of software and it exists in a single point in time. And to your point, it's like, well, the goal with, you know, this is meant to be a software. It's an output of a specific grant funded research project. And so like, it's been put up with a license and good documents, et cetera, et cetera. But then like, is the expectation that three years from now, um, when there need to be like major updates to that software, that the researcher as part of the sustainability picture should be going in and making those updates? Or is it like this has been released to the community, someone else can adopt that work? Yes, it it's, the, it's the latter. That there's, how do you think about building any sort of community around your work? So that it's not just always that single point researcher who has to do it, because a lot of them, <laughs> the researchers, a lot of them leave when the funding's gone. <laughs> That's, you know, um, if funding continues, no problem, or at least less of a problem. Um, so it just, it's more the latter, Tom. Like when a major update or a bug fix needs to, needs to occur, like who's responsible for that? Or does the software just go in the, in the toilet at that point? So I, it's, it's something I'm hearing a lot from grant funders and maybe it would be worth, would it be worth trying to have a grant funder come to a meeting like this and talk about what they mean when they talk about sustainability and what they're doing? Or is this something that I'm not terribly interested in? I wanna know what they're thinking okay. about sustainability. Okay. I see a lot of, um, you know this the seed funding and we're going to get you kicked off and and then and then you're on your own and they seem very hopeful that things will continue but they don't they don't seem to have a clear path for how it will happen well the other question is i mean this is kind of why we took on containers if there's sustainability and then there's the idea that you have to be re reproducible in a research organization so it's connected to reproducibility. Um, so yeah, we're interested and we're concerned about, about it, but ma mainly from the reproducibility standpoint, but I am interested and I'm also interested in how like data management plans might dovetail here or could dovetail here. Um, yeah, right. And the my example of the resources facilities, I just, just picking a spot <laughs> in the grant, but yeah, definitely data management, agreed. Yeah, I agree with that, Angela. And, and that's what I was hearing Tom say, that there's sort of two things you want to sustain. One is the reproducible bit of code that, that was used to, to to in the peer review um, and, and, and so that other scientists can go back and verify it um, and putting that in an archive somewhere so that it's always available. And then the other is maybe there's some software that... Um, is reusable by other groups and would want to continue and dynamically be changed over time and updated and would have value through that path. Do you, yeah, do you, so our repository, we have the Texas Digital Libraries. Mm -hmm. um, our repository can handle like long-term static storage. And then if people want dynamic storage, we actually send them up to TAC. Does everybody have resources like that? Or is that, um, 
is that like is that crazy to think that we could maybe lean on resources there to help just to, in terms of availability yeah just like if we're talking about i understand sustainability is you want to keep it alive and, and going um but sometimes you just need to put it away for a while i, I think it's well I, I need to think on this i need to think about it is it like an archiving question is that what you're asking no it was more if you're going to keep it well right because you're going to keep it in a in a workspace like in github i'm guessing mm -hmm. typically yeah the problem with github lorraine and i have talked about this and i'm still learning um is that that's you know it could be deleted at any time you could delete the repo uh, at any time you could take it make it private um and it, it's though it does a great job of version control it might um because you can delete it it's not guaranteed to be persistent so having it put in some kind of an archive where it's got a doi and you're guaranteed to get like all the components that are the the same from that particular run two years ago when the you know research was was happening or whatever yeah um, let me let me offer a different uh, use case that came up uh, related to what um, David and Angela have been talking about. Um, we had a researcher reach out um, because there is a piece of um, open source software that he contributes to and is related, directly connected to grant funded research he had. And he needed to, um, as a community member, make a pretty significant update to keep the software functional but he was not the owner of the of the uh, core project and could not locate the original owners. And so like he was kind of stuck in the sense of, you know, he, he was just basically stuck. He's like, there's an older license on this that they put on that prevents me from doing certain things that needs to be done. I'm the only one willing to do this work. And I'm kind of, I'm kind of, and it was, it was kind of an open question. And he basically had to do a very laborious workaround and, and create something new. But like, these are, these are the kind of questions that pop up um, for me when we start talking about sustainability. It's like, I, I think it's just like so much, I think it's very, it's very complex, especially when it starts to be more of a dynamic project. You know, because it's like we from our institution, our researchers could say, yes, we're really committed to the sustainability. And then you hit this wall in two years because it's like maybe it's a project that we contribute to, but we don't own. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Uh, That's interesting. Thanks for sharing, Tom. And I, I can imagine also like some security <laughs> updates and other things that would you'd want to patch and and, and add those updates. Um but but maybe not be able to or you know, from that same kind of situation. Very complicated. It is. Um, this is great. Let me. Uh, I'm going to do a couple things. One. Let me see if I can't get say somebody from Pose to come to this meeting and talk about what they mean when they are thinking about sustainability, and we can ask these questions. Might. My hope is, is in this conversation that through your OSPOs, you can, I, I'm, I'm trying to like, through your OSPOs, you can help researchers kind of skate to where the puck's going to be metaphor thing. That if agencies are going to ask for these things, let's start putting it in the proposals now and say, we're, we're already thinking about these. Um, and if it can give a leg up in the review process, like we're thinking about, um, we're thinking about archiving, we're thinking about um, ownership, we're thinking about governance, we're thinking about licensing, we're thinking about that handoff at the end of three years, then perhaps that could be a really great signal to put into a proposal that suggests that we're not just thinking about this three year window, <laughs> fund us now, but we're also thinking about what happens after that to make sure that the money that you're providing is really, really well spent. <laughs> we're not just gonna produce the things now, but we're going to keep producing these things. We're going to try to. So that was kind. Of, that's kind of the thought here. And again, I I see a lot of agencies having programs internally that are helping existing grantees 
address these issues, but it might be nice to to not just rely on the grant agencies to put people through this program, but maybe through the OSPOs to help researchers think about these issues as well. So, okay, cool. All right, um, that was a really great conversation. Thank you. Well, we're done. Um, it's midweek, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You're gonna do great for the rest of the week. <laughs> You're muted, Angela. Thanks for the no. book. It's a it's a big week for us. We have tons of stuff. So I'm I'm imagining everybody else is just crazy with the beginning of school too. So we're already like four weeks or five weeks in. Can you believe it? I know, but now's the prime time where everybody's gotten started. And so they're like looking around for resources. And so all of a sudden they're like, Can you show True. up here? Can you show up here? Can you show up here? <laughs> True. I'm like, Yes, we, we will show up everywhere. So <laughs> and right, well, Get going I'm, then, <laughs> Angela. And I'm I'm forwarding everyone that uh, containerization training that you sent. That looks amazing. I'm I'm gonna try to do it myself too. That looks so cool. Awesome. I'm glad. And we are really like whatever we can do to help you get that at your organization. They worked really hard to pull it all together, and we threw money in their direction. So however we can share it, let us know. Um, yeah, we're happy to do it, and I'm glad it's useful. So thanks for that. And I'm going to connect you with Michael. Michael's also working with Jonathan Star, Jonathan Star. So I'll connect you with Michael and see if you can get up and running on being creepy. <laughs> Perfect. Thank Tis you. Tis the season. Tis the season. <laughs> Tis the season. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye.